The following interview was recorded with Kevin Harris, the morning host on KWRD, The Word 100.7 FM in Dallas, Texas. Kevin Harris here with author Jim Phillips. He has written a controversial book, The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved, is this book that Jim has written. And I want to say something right off the bat here, and that is you would not want to cause people to doubt God's Word. You will you hold to the inerrancy of Scripture. As a matter of fact, that's why I base the entire book on nothing but the Scripture. I don't quote any extra-biblical sources, no other authors, no other works of any kind. I simply say, pretend you're on a jury, and in this case, the only evidence allowed in the courtroom is the Scriptures, nothing but the Scriptures. And based on the evidence contained in the Scriptures themselves, can we prove who is the disciple whom Jesus loved? Can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt it can't be John? And I argue that we can from just the Scriptures. And then can we determine who it might be? And I argue to at least a preponderance of the evidence we can. Yes, and this is very interesting because... Because if you were on to something here, Jim, then we have tightened up God's Word. I mean, one of the questions that we've tried to answer for hundreds and hundreds of years is who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. Exactly. You know? And we really don't know. That doesn't mean that we don't hold it to be inspired. Exactly. Nobody argues that because we don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews, that it's an attack on the authenticity. And the same here. There are a lot of theories around that it was everything from a group of students that worked under John to even Mary Magdalene. All of those are problematic, but if you pay attention to the details that God inspired the author to record in the scriptures about himself, and in fact, the way the other gospel writers treat this person, then those clues can point us to the actual author's identity. And if anybody wants to run this test, simply read the gospel that we call the Gospel of John from the beginning with the honest question, who in the scriptures would I come to the conclusion that this author might be based on just the facts? Give me just a single verse anywhere in the entire New Testament that would even suggest that this person might be John. And there isn't one. People say, well, John leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. No, he didn't. The disciple whom Jesus loved did. They say, Jesus gave his mother to John. No, he didn't. He gave his mother to the disciple whom Jesus loved. We impose that on the text because that's what we've been taught. But sadly, it's, it's kind of like the flat earth theory. How did everyone know the earth was flat? Because everyone taught the earth was flat, but the earth was never flat. And John never wrote what we call the Gospel of John. What I wanted to ask you, Jim, is what started this whole thing for you? I imagine that you, as a Christian and as a student of God's Word, were just cruising along, saying, well, you know, assuming that John wrote it, and John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. What caused you to want to look further into this? Just like you said, I, like everybody else, had believed what I was taught about this. And then one time I walked into a Bible study with my sister, and she said, the author never called himself John, but he always called himself by these phrases, the disciple whom Jesus loved, or the other disciple, or the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And I paused in that moment, and I realized that even though I always tried to be someone who paid attention to the details in scriptures, that I'd never bothered to pay attention to that detail. And my mind started racing. I wondered, okay, why did God have the author do that? Why did he have him refer to himself this way? And then she pointed me to two verses of Scripture which convinced me in that moment that we'd been wrong because she identified someone from the Scriptures who is identified as having the key relationship with Jesus, the key relationship being the disciple whom Jesus loved. And what's interesting is there is only one male human being in the entire New Testament prior to the resurrection who is both identified by name and said to be loved by Jesus. And that is not John. As a matter of fact, Peter was tops among the twelve and everybody knew it, including Peter. So that also presents some interesting things when we see the dynamic going on. For example, the Last Supper when it's going around the table, and each one of these men who have been with Jesus for all this time, they're doubting their own character. They're not just asking who the betrayer is. They're saying, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And it comes around the table to finally Peter, and even he doesn't dare ask the question. But he leans over, and he says to this unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved, who appears in the Scripture in that verse for the very first time, and he says, you ask him. And he's the one guy at the table that doesn't bat an eye. He says, who is it? Because he's the one person at the table that knows he could not possibly deny Jesus. Jesus has done something very special to this person that changed him forever. We could see nowhere in the scriptures that John wouldn't have a reason to question himself like the rest of the twelve. We could see nowhere in scripture where John was loved above the rest of the twelve. But this disciple is not one of the disciples, plural, whom Jesus loves, but he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that singles him out. Jim Phillips, author of The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved. Now, there's something that I found very compelling that you wrote, and that is a hidden key in the book of Acts. And I have, I've never noticed this. In the scripture is Acts 4.13. Yes. In Acts 4, Peter and John are hauled before the Sanhedrin, and they give this wonderful testimony. And Acts 4.13 is the record of the response. It says, they, referring to the Sanhedrin who were present there, they beheld the boldness of Peter and John, 
And they marveled, and they recognized that these were unlearned and ignorant men, and they took knowledge that these were those that had been with Jesus. Now let's dissect that for a second. What's going on in that verse? The Sanhedrin is recognizing that these are unlearned and ignorant men. Well, that's not saying that they're stupid. It's just saying that either from their manner of dress or their vocabulary or the Galilean accents or whatever combination of those things, they recognize that these are Galilean fishermen, and they're not men of letters. They're not trained scholars. And then it goes on to say, and they took knowledge that these were those that had been with Jesus. And you almost get the picture of them slapping their heads going, oh, these were those disciple guys. But what's going on there is they're learning that information for the first time in that verse. You don't learn those things about someone a second time. If you know somebody, you know them. You would know that they're from the southern part of the country because of an accent the first time you meet them, and you would need to learn that thing again. What's interesting is the other disciple, the unnamed other disciple that goes in with Jesus on the night that he's betrayed, we're told why he's able to get into the palace. It says he's able to get into the palace because he is known to the high priest. And the next verse even stresses it again. Peter can't get in the door. He's come also, but he can't get in the door. This unnamed disciple goes over and talks to the doormaid, and he's able to get Peter in because he's known to the high priest. It's repeated again. And then as Peter's going past the doormaid, she says to Peter, Are thou also one of this man's disciples? The little clue there is also. She doesn't recognize that Peter is publicly associated with Jesus, but she already is telling us that she knows that that other unnamed disciple is publicly associated with Jesus. Now, it's untenable to believe that everybody from the high priest to the doormaid forgot they knew John by the time Acts 4.13 rolled around. The man that went in with Jesus that night was known to the high priest. John in Acts 4.13 is clearly not known to the high priest. There's a bottom line. The man who went in before the high priest was known to him before Jesus' trial. Yes. But Acts 4.13, there seems to be an indication there that John was not known known to him. Yes. Now, I don't want to hold uh, listeners in too much suspense here. Who do you propose is the disciple whom Jesus loved? The two verses my sister shared with me that first night that I jumped on this question was, Lord, thou whom thou lovest is sick, and Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And I started realizing, wait a second, look at the behavior of this unnamed disciple. When all the others are fleeing in fear of their life, this guy stays with Jesus acting like he's got no fear of death which would exactly fit a raised from the dead Lazarus. This unnamed disciple acts precisely like we would expect a raised from the dead Lazarus to act. We're told that Lazarus was loved by Jesus, and after we're already told that, Jesus raises this man from the dead. What's he going to do? Is he going to go back to just living his normal life, or is this guy going to be changed like nobody else? Is he going to stick to Jesus like white on rice, the phrase goes? And that's precisely what we see this person doing. He sticks with Jesus when all the others flee in fear of their life. It explains the rumor of why they thought this person wouldn't die. It also, interestingly enough... It explains why he was known. Explains why he was known. They would not only put out a hit contract out on Lazarus, he's the only other person besides Jesus prior to the resurrection that the high priest felt so threatened from that they put a hit contract out on him too. Look at what happens on the triumphal entry. It says they came out to the triumphal entry because of the raising of Lazarus. That's why they came out to greet Jesus. All of the evidence fits together and fits like a glove, including, by the way, the motive, which may be too long for us to get into here today, but people are welcome to get the book. It's for free online. Give me the website. The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved.com. The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved.com. It certainly would explain why Lazarus, first of all, absolutely stuck with Jesus, why this disciple was there at the cross, there taking care of Christ's mother, fearless when uh, the other ones split. What would you be afraid of? He, unlike any other disciple, experienced this in his person, and we would expect him to be changed and changed forever. Two more questions I want to ask you. First of all, John is the only book that records this account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And skeptics of the scripture have thrown this at me, Jim, and that is, if I mean, this would be a very profound miracle. And if it were actually performed by Christ, then why didn't the other gospels mention it? as an apologetic for Christ. I mean, this would be a biggie. Why are they not saying it? Now, I've heard many different reasons for that. I just want to know if you had any comments. Sure. If you're going to write a book to tell people about Jesus and you want to record that he was working miracles from God, you can write about healing a withered hand, but if you write about him raising someone from the dead, that's a better miracle. Because in one case, you got the living human body to work with. In the other case, you don't even have that. Right. But it is missing from the other three Gospels. Why? The other three Gospel writers freely mention John, but they never mention the disciple whom Jesus loved. Even though he is such a profound person in the gospel that we call the gospel of John, this unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved is left out of these other gospels. 
What's interesting is what's left out of the gospel that we call the gospel of John is key evidence that we would expect to find in a gospel that was written by John, such as two key events that John was one of only three eyewitnesses at. The Mount of Transfiguration and the Garden of Gethsemane are not in the gospel that bears John's name. Final question here, Jim. What do scholars think of this? Here's a question I've recently taken to posing to him. Should a Bible teacher or anybody else teach something as being biblically true if they cannot cite a single verse in support of it? And usually they'll say, well, no. And I say, okay, let's look at your teaching on this subject. When you say the disciple in Jesus loved John, you're adding to the Bible a parenthesis that God did not authorize. Do the scriptures indicate that's John? Show me a verse. They can't, and they also can't argue against the fact that Acts 4.13 proves it cannot be John. To the scholars, what I'm saying is, you say, hey, check me out, search the scriptures. But when we do that and we come back and say, hey, wait a second, I think I've seen that you're wrong in this. Then you can't come back and say, well, well, I can't be wrong. Or you can't say, well, I can't be wrong in this. Well, why? Because that would mean everybody was wrong. Well, okay, that can happen. We saw it in Jesus' day with the scholars in his day. We saw it with the flat earth teaching. We see it in our own day amongst all the bright minds that believe Darwinian evolution. The book is simply saying, look at the scriptures. Since we say that the Bible is the inspired and infallible yardstick, that's where we go to learn if we're wrong. What I'm hoping will come from this is to drive people to a closer study of his word, to relying more on his word than we do the teachers that we hear, because we've been far too eager at receiving the word with all readiness of mind, and we've been real slack on searching the scripture to see if it's so. God, in this case, has preserved the truth for us. It's here in the scriptures. We can go. We can read the evidence. Now we can go back to the teachers and say, why would anyone believe that this was John, since not only does no evidence point towards John, but Acts 4.13, amongst the rest of the evidence, proves it can't be John. We have got to decide whether what we're being taught is true or not. We cannot just assume it's true because someone has went to seminary. The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved, written by Jim Phillips. Check it out for yourself. The website? The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved.com. The Disciple Whom Jesus Loved.com.